The earliest example of an input device in computing can be seen in 1725, more than two centuries before the proliferation of the electronic personal computers we know and love, when Joseph Marie Jacquard used an early punch card to semi-automate the loom. A portrait of him exists as a result of this innovation, as well as the 2400 punch cards fed into it. These paper cards fed into an automata paved the way for generations of input devices in computational tools, be they mechanical, electromechanical, or digital. From this humble beginning, let us examine how far our prolific input devices have become, and what came before the capacitive touchscreens and voice commands in our smartphones. Let's start with that logical beginning, the punch card. The punch cards once used to record instructions for a semi-automated loom gave way to mechanical data entry and processing under IBM, which required punching specific holes in specific places on a roll or card of paper before input. Key punches were then developed to efficiently input data into these cards before processing. These inherited many qualities of the typewriter used for the mass mechanization of print as data could be input by hitting labeled buttons. The genesis of QWERTY keyboards in particular lies in these key punches, as the key placement was designed so as to place commonly used keys farther apart rather than closer together to avoid jamming, though moving forward, QWERTY laid out persisted. These key punched punch cards were appropriately used in the first computers, the Atonisov Berry computer of 1939, and even the Binac computer of 1949 used a key punch device to input data onto magnetic tape instead of paper cards. These mechanical key punch devices would persist and persist until the mid 60s, with the only notable exceptions being teletype key punches that electromagnetically sent information over short range, high latency lines. The electromechanical key punch still relied on mechanical steps and imprints that slowed the process of the user seeing the result. But in 1964, Bell Labs and MIT created the Multix computer, which introduced a video display terminal. Using essentially a converted electronic key punch, text was visible on the terminal as it was typed which made communicating commands, programs, and controls to computers much more expedient than previous type machines by removing the punch card as a middleman. This led the way to electronic QWERTY keyboards with switches remaining the primary standard input device well into the 80s. Apple, Radio Shack, and Commodore all began mass producing keyboards to be included with their computers. This changed with the Model M mechanical keyboard from IBM in 1986, which succeeded by offering an alternative to the typewriter-esque choices offered up until then, though they were bulky compared to their future iterations. They were also durable and quick, and some Model Ms still persist to this day with the help of adapters that allowed them to be plugged into a USB port. At time of writing, the company Unicomp still manufactures them. This puts it into context. Membrane keyboards using synthetic plastics to complete circuits as switches have risen in popularity for their affordability and slim design, but the mechanical keyboard of the Model M is still widely praised, and these types of keyboards are still widely used for their tactile feedback and the classic clicking key press that makes it almost viscerally satisfying for some to use. The Model M marked a somewhat conclusive departure from the era of key punching cards, as it moved the industry away from repurposed typewriters to keyboards engineered to be fully electronic in design, with a form made for protecting its electronic components. While still abstract in use relative to a touchscreen, Indirect input devices had come a long way, as the removal of the card aspect made them much less indirect. But the computer mouse was poised to carry forth the next leap ahead. 
The first computer mouse was developed in the year 1964. It was a clunky, large wooden shell containing a circuit board and two metal wheels. Douglas Engelbart's original design was further iterated on in 1972, when Bill English would replace the pair of wheels with a ball that would serve as an intermediary of sorts between the surface the mouse was on and the wheels. This allowed the tracking of motion in any direction with relative efficiency. English's innovation combined with his position at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center meant that the mouse would become an integral part of the Xerox Alto computer system, the first mini computer with a graphical user interface. The Alto computer was important. It cemented the mouse as a go-to pointing device for mini computers going forward. It wasn't really until eight years later that the mouse would be further changed in a significant way. The trackballs, while mostly effective, would collect dust easily and clog up the works. This problem could be effectively eliminated by the optical mouse, developed by Lisa Williams and Robert Cherry around 1980. A mouse that essentially used a miniature camera tracking relative motion along a surface, and while early iterations remained on the pricey side for a while and required pre-configured mouse pads, when the microcontrollers manufactured for the mice became stronger and cheaper, the optical mice became the dominant type of pointing device in personal computers, and over time became less of an accessory and more of a necessity. At least as a pointing device that wasn't on your pointer finger. And on that note, before we look at the smartphone of the modern day, it's worth noting that before the iPhone took off, personal digital assistants used styluses for screen contact interfaces and were functional mobile business machines. Many were manufactured and sold from the 90s through the late 2000s. In other words, touchscreens aren't that new. But one of the early weaknesses was that PDA touchscreens were generally resistive. Many required a stylus for precise input, as well as mostly being only single touch, with exceptions. Bill Buxton's capacitive touchscreen in 1983 paved the way for not only increasingly accurate touchscreens, but gesture controls, as utilized in the Fingerworks gesture-controlled touch interfaces. Fingerworks was bought and their tech was used by Apple for the massively successful iPhone, and they enabled the gesture-controlled, physicality-infused GUIs that define the smartphone of it today, in 2008. For the sake of time, we can't necessarily dive deep into full motion and voice control systems, and they aren't really in a position at the time of writing to be comparable to keyboards and mice. Motion capture is useful, but situational and the Microsoft Kinect's failure in the recreational market and its lack of presence in the practical input market means that gesture controls and mini computers continue to be defined as the use of multi-touch screens and creative responses to swipes on a phone rather than the snap of a finger or the wave of a hand. Voice controls are useful but still developing and their 90% accuracy make them a useful supplement to other inputs right now, but not yet a replacement for them. In other words, these interfaces are not yet in a place to replace other input devices like the keyboard and mouse, but they may be. It took three decades to move from the key punch to the popularization of the keyboard, and two decades from then that the popularization of the mouse came. It's not out of the question to see voice controls take a larger place in the next decade, or for gesture controls to leave the sphere of the dedicated hobbyists and artists. Mice and keys dominate now, but it wasn't so long ago that paper cards were the future of computing. Perhaps the script for this very video could one day be entirely dictated, without the necessity of plastic keys as an intermediary. But until that day, we enjoy the content of 10-minute historical summaries by using our computer mice to point at the video, press our finger down, and cl click.